So I didn't fail. I'm instrument rated and it feels kind of surreal. This episode is going to be the debrief of the flight test. Ironically, what I ended up tripping over was something to do with the Garmin 430, but the way I dealt with it, the examiner was impressed with. It still cost me a two. My only two on the whole flight was essentially caused by that problem. So I own that two on my flight test with pride because I feel like, yes, it's a two, but what it represents is a lesson of making the right decision. Yeah. This uh, was an intentional choice. I did want to challenge myself to do it in a very basic airplane. No autopilot. I really wouldn't have it any other way. It was hard. Kudos to you. And I also think that story that you told me about trying to figure out a backup system in the hold on your GPS, um, that was the moment where you passed the check ride. Flying with this type of setup, I think, is going to make me a better instrument pilot going forward with all the awesome glass and automation that I will have access to. Yeah, I need to shake your hand because that was... Congratulations. Really, Steve, I mean, you worked your ass off. I love it when uh, students or candidates, shall we say, because you're no longer a student. A candidate comes and says, oh, thanks so much. And I'm like, you're the one that did all the work. You really did. But what's weird is that it has not felt like this incredible relief or whatever people are asking me how I feel. The truth is, this has been a muscle that has been flexed on and off for a long time. All right, so I really appreciate the tough love. It's literally been five years of being teased increasingly online by a very loving and supportive community, mostly. <laughs> For several years running, April Fool's Day posts were made on Reddit claiming that I'd gotten it done, including one that went as far as making a video that ended with a rickroll. So no question my journey to the instrument rating was a long one. I do not recommend taking five years to get this rating. However, doing it that way did help solidify a lot of things for me. It wasn't efficient and it was painful at times. I almost quit several times, I'm gonna be honest, but I was fairly confident that I knew the procedures, I knew what I needed to do. I'd been able to practice in the sim at home and that's a huge help. Oh yeah, I'm giving this entire setup away. I also kind of knew at any given time throughout those years, I wasn't in a good spot to be able to use the rating on a regular basis after getting it, and that definitely puts you in a very unsafe spot. When you have the rating, now it's actually almost more dangerous because you need to keep doing it. Uh, historically, people that have gotten instrument ratings or multi-ratings and then not exercised or been tested, not even exercised, because you'll fly around and nothing ever goes wrong, but they don't get run through the ringer. Well, that's what I found was interesting. The VFR is all about black and white, go, no, go. Yeah. IFR introduced that world of gray. And that's why I can, we canceled the flight test like five times for me, just because there was a bunch of, well, there was some clearly no-go days. Listen, uh, you know, the VFR lets you go four out of the 10 days that you want to go. Uh, the IFR still only lets you go eight of the 10 days that you want to go, because there's still going to be ice, there's still going to be thunderstorms, there's still going to be just a forecast that just makes you go, hmm. When I scrub a flight because of the weather, then for the rest of the day, I sit there and I monitor the weather and see if it turned out as bad as they said it was gonna turn out. And then I kick myself saying, ah, I could have gone, or no, it was a good decision not to go. And I'm probably two thirds, yeah, it was a good decision that I didn't go. So, let's, uh, let's get into this debrief. I did get a really super detailed track log, so we'll be debriefing that, focusing on my one error. In Canada, we break it down. I'll show the little thing here with the score. It's like one out of four. Uh, I think one is like a critical error, which is like, that just fails your whole test. Two is like a major error. And I think if you get three twos, it doesn't matter what the rest of your marks add up to, you fail. So I was very motivated not to get any twos. Unfortunately, I did get one but it was such a great learning moment that I'm okay taking this forward into my future flying. What I learned while I got that too was probably one of the most important things during the whole test. So let's get into it. So no question having four flight on a yoke mount was a huge part of my workflow. Put everything right in front of me. It was super easy to get the plates. I mean, there's the airport plate. And if I wanted to check out the plates, I had them in nice binders. So I could just really easily see what I wanted to do but yeah I mean what a powerful tool to have this is they're obviously a supporter of the channel but this is something I've been using since way before flight shops even existed game changer for me 
amazing situational awareness. Having said that, I spent most of the time in plates mode. I didn't really use the map on for flight while I was flying. I had too much of a scan to worry about. It was just too important to stay super tight on this scan, dealing with the avionics. Uh, yeah, like I said, it was pretty much plates was what I was looking at to brief and then to kind of get situational awareness, whether I was holding or doing an approach or looking at my minimums. That's kind of what the iPad was doing. It was like a plate holder, obviously geo-referenced, so that's very handy. Having the Garmin G5, no question, is a game changer. That gives you track information beyond a nice little tiny EFIS. Incredibly good instrument. You know, the G5 has airspeed. It even has GPS ground speed. It even has GPS track. It has altitude. It has a yeah. ball and it has a turn coordinator, but it's not certified to replace those. It's only certified to replace the attitude indicator, which is why all the other stuff is still there. At the end of the day, I'm still dealing with a six pack scan. So I was still kind of doing the radial scan while trying to manage the uh, Garmin GNS 430. So I think the most important thing about my preparation for this flight test, beyond the fact that I ramped up and down literally five times, actually six, my, my test was the sixth attempt to book it. So I had ramped up and down five times over the course of three weeks, which was exhausting. But it really solidified a bunch of things in terms of the workflow of getting ready for the tests, both preparation of doing my homework, checking the weather, but also trying to think through like, what is this? Is this a test? Is this a real world flight? How do you wrap your head around what you're about to do? You know what you're doing, you just have to show a guy that you know how to do it. So as I drove to the airport the morning of my test, I just basically thought to myself, I'm gonna go flying with my daughter in the back seat and I'm going to do everything safely and thoroughly. I'm not gonna think about the fact that I'm being tested, I'm just gonna do it like it's real. And that really did help. I very quickly kind of forgot about the examiner and just showed him that I knew what I was doing. I feel bad for some of these flight schools that only have, uh, you know, modern G1000 cockpits in their airplanes, and then the first job the kid gets is is on some old metro liner that's got nothing but steam gauges in it, and he's looking at it like, I don't know, like I look at an oven. I don't, you know, I don't know how to put the broiler on. On the other hand, if there is no automation in there at all, then you have no option. You have to you have to hand fly everything, and as you said, between using steam gauges but with a not having automation, it, it really kind of prepares you for the worst case scenario, which is nothing but a good thing. With that in mind, I do have a path now toward having access regularly to an airplane that is a great instrument and cross-country platform. It's the RV-14 that we're building. It's gonna have some amazing avionics, autopilot. So I knew going forward that I had a good shot at being able to stay current in some really amazing technology. Having said that, the one time I tripped up on the flight test involved tripping over the technology, ironically. So uh, luckily I caught it and didn't make the problem any worse, but we'll get into that. Hey Steve, I'm here with Rob. We're just finishing up a lesson. I just wanted to say congrats on your instrument rating, man. That was awesome work. That is not an easy thing to do. And that moment that you told me about when you were trying to figure out the OBS mode and the 430 in the background and it became like a, a rabbit hole, um, the fact that you blew that off, recognized that it was a rabbit hole, and got back to the VHF signal, which was the primary signal, in my opinion, that's the moment you passed that ride. On the way to the hold, the examiner asked me, are you expecting wind drift? And I kind of cockily said, I don't really care. <laughs> yes, I mean, yeah, I got the ATIS, I know where the wind's coming yeah. from, but I'm going to have this magenta line, it's going to be great. And, yeah. then, and then it was almost like karma. You know, everybody's so convinced that the GPS magenta line is going to be more helpful or give them some situational awareness that everybody's working to get it in place, even when it's a backup system. Um, so I think it's really important, especially on an instrument check ride or when things get tight in the real world, to ask yourself, what's my primary source of navigation here? Am I flying a VOR approach in ILS? I mean, is it a VHF thing that's primary or is it a GPS thing that's primary? I haven't looked at the track log yet, but when I do, I'll put it into this video and we'll see how many went from a four to a two on my holds. Because as I entered, I screwed up the OBS and I started tripping over it. I wasn't going to be able to use the magenta line properly since I couldn't set it up right. And I was, my scan kind of stagnated for, and I knew I couldn't let that happen. And it still did. I started to go down a tunnel vision hole. Jason Miller talks about the beat of staying alive as far as your scan. Like you just like looking at this kind of a tempo at your different instruments and sometimes you stay on one thing for two beats maybe three beats but then get back to the rest of it 
and that's that's the only way it's going to work if you're hand flying uh, and for me the whole flight went great except for the one brief moment as soon as we crossed over i want to break it down and understand how i screwed that up because it normally works real nice where you can suspend it at the right time and then you can turn i think what i did was i v-loped because i had the i knew i had the ILS dialed in so i v-loped it and that's why turning the OBS wouldn't talk to the GPS. Yeah, it, with the 430, depending on what it's connected to. But if you if you suspend sequencing by pushing the OBS button, um, you will suspend sequencing, and you'll create an OBS line through the through the next waypoint. Um, but if you switch to VLOC first, and then you hit OBS, then it says, "Well, you've already gone into VLOC, so there is no OBSing anymore. You're supposed to line up on the localizer." However, a little box will open up and say, what course would you like yeah. to OBS so that, on? And I, and I practiced with that in the sim, but for whatever reason, while I was hand flying, reaching over in front of him, I couldn't remember how to get the cursor, because you, you got to use it to like one digit and then the other two. Yeah. I bounced off the upper limit of the altitude allowance, which cost me a two, fixed it. I said correcting, I pointed to the instrument and uh, I knew, almost had a panic attack at that moment of thinking, what do I do? Can I let that lie? Or do I need to fix it? Does the examiner need to see me know how to use it? Or can I just say to him, you know what? I'm tripping over it. And that's when it dawned on me. It's like, it's not a critical part of this task. I do not need that to work for the hold. It's nice. It's super helpful to have that magenta line telling me what my inbound track is. But it didn't work. I had the OBS set wrong. I think it was like 091 and I needed it to be 117. So I just let it go. I decided this whole thing is about to take down this entire flight if I let that compromise me. So I didn't. I told him out loud, I was like, I'm tripping over it. I got tasks that are more important. I've got to aviate, navigate, communicate, and then avionicate. That's the fourth thing on the list. It's not a critical part of this task. So I let it go. I did my hold tracking the loc using the needles and VLOC mode. And uh, then for the outbound, Having the G5 to tell me what my actual track was was pretty critical, so I just made sure I kept my scan on my track, kept my scan on my distance. The 430 was still giving me my distance information. I was doing three mile legs, so I just had to make sure my distance was good, my track was good, and I continued my scan for altitude and the G5 giving me my track. I really couldn't get it wrong. I just had to stop letting that screw me up, and it was probably five seconds. That's all it took to bust my altitude and almost go down a rabbit hole of putting myself in an unsafe situation and potentially failing the flight test. Ironically, these holds are beautiful. If you look at the track log, I ended up getting stuck there because when we briefed entering the hold, the examiner told me that I was to hold until he told me he was satisfied. I didn't know how long that was gonna be, but the first orbit around, I finished briefing the plate and then he told me he was satisfied. As I went to key the mic to ask for my approach clearance, I was told that I actually was gonna have to stay in the hold for real because there was incoming jet traffic. So ironically, I had to hand fly like four or five more orbits in the hold without the Garmin 430 helping me out with the track. So that was a good learning moment, but it worked out. I was looking at a magenta line that was just not at all what I wanted to see. I just distinctly remember that. So I was ignoring the magenta line and tracking the needle. If the GPS thing is not primary if it's a backup system right like when you hit that little button that says i'm only using this for guidance right everybody has that moment in flying where they start to you know go down a rabbit hole to try to figure out a problem and what you did was recognize that the problem was a secondary system and not critical to you flying the hold and as soon as you made the decision to abandon that rabbit hole and let that sort of magenta pandora's box just go and come back to what's primary for you, the fact that you're flying a VHF needle, you're in a hold and you don't need that system to do this properly. Man, if I was your examiner, that's when I would just watching you make that decision and prioritize flying the airplane on a primary signal would have been the moment where I thought, okay, this guy's ready. So that's huge. And you know, just so you know, nine times out of 10, it doesn't go that way. So Jason was inspired to actually make a really cool last minute IFR check ride tips video. Definitely head to his channel to check it out. The kind of surreal thing about this test was that after that glitch with the hold, the ILS approach went great. And in Cloud Ahoy, not only can you overlay the specific procedure that you flew, but it actually auto detects the maneuver and assigns a score to it based on your aircraft category. You can edit these variables if you need to, but I found the defaults were really quite accurate. This scoring feature is more designed for organizations and flight schools, but it's pretty cool if you want to debrief to this kind of level. 
I felt like everything else was going well. I had to do an RNAV approach to get home. Then being on final for the RNAV, knowing I was fairly confident that I had passed, assuming I didn't screw anything up from this point forward. <laughs> there were a couple of moments where I had to like snap out of it. It's like, it's not over. So it was kind of surreal when I made the turn from box in onto final. The needle stayed centered for the whole turn. And for a moment there, I was like, it's either broken or I'm doing this perfectly. <laughs> But I watched the GPS sequence, so I knew that it was still getting me the track. I knew that I had it set to GPS mode. But on all, it went quite well. I got a good score, and I feel safe and prepared. I think that's the main thing. I don't feel like I squeaked by. No question I squeaked by on the written test. I'll be the first to admit that I suck at traditional studying, and I had a very difficult time. I failed the first time I tried to write that test, and took a year off, basically, before I went and faced it again. So I had a really hard time with the written test for the instrument rating. Squeaked by, barely passed, but I did not want to squeak by for the flight test. I wanted to know that I was ready, that I was safe, and uh, it went really well. I had great training, lots of great mentors, so many people to thank. And it did take me forever, but my path has been pretty unique and different, and it was an honor and a privilege to share it. Obviously, there's a long way to go, lots more learning. I'm gonna get the multi-IFR. I'll probably do that in a G1000. Right, so to be clear, I'm not giving up on home simming. I'm just gonna be upgrading mine, which is why I'm giving away the one that's centered around the 430 unit. If you need a setup like that, I'm gonna figure out a way to structure a giveaway targeted at you guys who specifically need it. Um, stand by. I guess join the mailing list at flightchops.com. We'll send news about how we're gonna do that within the next week or two, I think. Meantime, thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it and keep your flight chops sharp. So anyway, I just wanted to say congrats. Rob's a big fan too. Congrats, Steve. Thanks, man. I would be sitting here now if you hadn't pointed me in Jason's direction. So well done, buddy. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right, I'm going to cut these cameras because that okay. is now an hour and 16 minutes of Dennis Gold. So as hard as the holidays were for me this year, being stuck sort of in go mode constantly for what turned out to be weeks, it was worth it. Sharing this process has been humbling and rewarding, and uh, I really don't regret any of it. Honestly, the end of the year in 2019 was very difficult. I really thought I was gonna get it done, but the pivot that I did at the last minute on January 30th turned out to be one of the coolest, most rewarding things I've ever done, which was invite thousands of people to tell me about their year and their successes, and we made a really great, fun video out of their stuff that was turned around in 48 hours because me in my bathrobe being depressed on the morning of the 30th when it was unflyable, it was hilariously unflyable, was motivated and inspired to do something community driven. Hey Steve, how's it going? My name's Harris, I'm uh, coming to you from Marine Corps Air Station, Camp Pendleton, California. And I just wanted to say I love the channel, I love the content you put out. Um, and I know you're gonna rock your IFR uh, check ride, man. You're gonna do a good job. Um, I'm actually a controller here at Camp Pendleton, I'm not a pilot. So uh, I understand if this doesn't make it into your video, but I just wanted to say that uh, my main accomplishment for 2019 was this bad boy right here. This means that I am a control tower operator. This is my first, uh, first CTO that I got. Pretty proud of it. It's been a long time training for it and uh, I can sympathize with you on some of the some of the struggle days that you had trying to learn some of that stuff. It's the, the same with us too. So uh, that was my accomplishment and wishing you a happy new year, man.